Welcome to the digital lecture series of FU Best, the European Studies Program of Freie Universität Berlin. In 15 sessions, we will offer you a broad overview of FU Best's academic course offerings. You can choose from 12 subject course lectures representing a wide range of disciplines and three live sessions on German language and culture. Our series is divided into four themes relevant to European studies in Germany and Berlin today. Each will be dealt with by a group of FU Best instructors from the perspectives of their particular disciplines or German language levels. Part one provides some background to modern shapes of Berlin, Germany and Europe and asks how history influences the present. As examples, we will look at physical appearance in Berlin's architecture, the psychological and sociological roots of complicity in the atrocities of the Third Reich, how Jewish culture and writing has reclaimed a place in German society, and the role of legal thought in the rebuilding of Europe in the 20th century. All sessions will offer you insights into our instructors' master-long regular courses within the FUBEST program and the way in which they integrate Berlin as a historical and cultural location. We hope you enjoy the online program we have assembled for you. For more details about the lecture series and our regular on-site FUBEST program, visit our website later. You will also find additional information at the end of this lecture. With that, enjoy the following session and see you soon in Berlin. Hello and welcome to the lecture Jewish German Life Then and Now. Instead of presenting to you a broad overview of all the developments in the last time, I want to present you some examples because I think there are telling examples. My name is Christoph Kutt and I'm an instructor at FU Best. I'm teaching the course Jewish Life in Central Europe. Instead of reading to you um, what my fields of interest are, I will later on tell you something about it. But first, I will give you an impression of what you can expect from the course Jewish Life in Central Europe. The course Jewish Life in Central Europe covers quite a long period of time, from the Enlightenment to the present, and a diverse geographical and political space, from Germany in the West to Russia in the East. Let me emphasize in the beginning that it is not class Holocaust studies, Although, of course, the Holocaust plays a major role in it, it is about Jewish life, with emphasis on life. But because Jews, as a religious minority in a Christian-dominated continent, always were confronted with different restrictions, we will have to talk about the different ways to react to repression. Therefore, we will focus in each session on certain countries and narrow time per periods. My aim is not to establish one narrative, but to highlight a variety of aspects. Speaking about the past is difficult. What is left of it? Some artifacts and books about the time you can read? Therefore, we will use the arts and philosophy to get access to the Lebenswelt of times long gone. Closely looked at, a verse of a poem a sentence of a philosopher will give us additional insight that sociological statistics and data don't provide. In this lecture I want to tell you something about my research interests and then give three other examples how this might look like in class. I chose the examples for a specific reason. Many visitors come to Berlin for its past to see the Berlin Wall or what is left of it. But walls and physical barriers are only the most obvious ways to hinder people from moving and coming together. And not every wall is made of stone. So I chose three stories how Jews dealt with physical 
and other barriers in Berlin and elsewhere. Besides teaching, I am currently writing a biography of the German literary critic Walter Böhlich. He was born in 1921 in Breslau, which is today in Poland. In researching his life I got a sense of the problems of identity and self-identification in German Jewry. In an interview Böhlich once said, I am not Jewish in a rational sense, but are there other ways? The story of his life goes like this. His father was a scholar, his mother a librarian. Everything quite normal. An intellectual household, Walter and his twin Wolf were raised as Christians, got baptized. They were taught to be very patriotic, to love the country. In the 1930s they attended a gymnasium a quite interesting school, the Johannesgymnasium in Breslau, also called Johanneum. It was a model project, unique in its time. The aim of the school was to ease religious tensions. Therefore, a third of the students were Catholic, a third Protestant, and a third Jewish. This changed drastically in 1933, when the Nazis came to power. You may imagine how they disliked the concept of the school. But their first aim was a political one. They chased out their opponents, social democrats and liberals. Then they created a law that restricted the number of Jews who were allowed to apply for attending the school. But still, they were not satisfied. We know about the specifics in the school because of the diary of Willy Kohn. Kohn was a teacher at the school, a Jew, a social democrat, a Zionist. He was murdered in the Holocaust. When the Nazis weren't successful in decreasing the number of Jews attending the gymnasium, they found a trick. The school had to merge with a neighboring school that was known to be far more conservative. What now begins is an example for anti-Semitic actions, not of the Nazis in power, but from below, executed by students and other teachers. The Hitler youth of the school they had to merge with demanded measures against Jews. From now on, they were not allowed to join sport groups. Jewish students were attacked. Jewish teachers like Willy Kohn were forced out. The SA came to the school library to collect books to burn them. Over time, the number of Jewish students really decreased. Most of them now attended Jewish schools. And this was the main aim of the Nazis at that time, to separate Jews and non-Jews. Walter Böhlich, as a student, I guess, witnessed all this. But it didn't relate to him. He may, might have thought. In 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were released. They defined who was to be treated as a Jew. Everybody who had three Jewish grandparents. And Jewish here didn't mean to belong to a Jewish community. It was defined racially. And that meant, although baptized too, Walter Böhlich's mother, Edith, was Jewish by law. And Walter Böhlich himself was now called half-Jewish. But if we are to believe his twin, the children were not aware of this. Her parents hadn't told them in order to protect them. And this is quite possible, because Jews married to non-Jews were far more protected than others. This changed in 1938, when the parents were divorced. Now her mother had lost any protection. And the twins, as they said, for the first time realized they had Jewish ancestors. They both finished school. And after that, they both 
joined the Wehrmacht, the German army. That sounds absurd, but many other Jews and half-Jews made the same decision. Some thought the military might protect them from prosecution. Others, like Walter Böhlich, were proud Germans. For him it was kind of an obligation to serve. And here you see, when he joined the army, they didn't call him Jewish. You can read here religion, and his draft card says that he is a Christian. So in 1940, he was a soldier, fighting in Dunkirk, France, and he was later stationed in Paris. In the same year, in 1940, Hitler realized that in his Wehrmacht, Jews served too. And he got angry, and he decided that all Jews had to leave the Wehrmacht. This is true for Walter Böhlich too. So Walter Böhlich came back in his hometown and, and began to study arts and German literature. Or at least he was attending classes. But as a half-Jew, he wasn't allowed to study regularly. And here he made the experience that influenced his life. Some students were Nazis, some were not. Some professors were Nazis, some were not. Some helped him, some not. He even found a professor who encouraged him to write reviews in an academic journal. And so he did and the articles were published. To make a living, he worked in a construction company, the Huter Hoch und Tiefbau AG. It doesn't exist anymore, but he was employed in the archive of the company in Breslau. I knew nothing about that company and looked it up in Wikipedia. There's only a German a homepage for that. Someone had copied many valuable information about the company from an old PR brochure. There even was a long list of buildings the company erected prior to World War II and after World War II. But my question was, what did they do in World War II? So I did some research and found out the company built the crematoriums in Auschwitz. For the first time in my life, I edited a Wikipedia uh, page. You can see it here. Now I edit um, the crematoriums in Auschwitz as buildings erected by this company. Walter Böhli certainly didn't know about this. Or did he? I don't know. In 1942, his grandmother in Hamburg received a letter ordering her to come to a collection point to be deported to the East. She refused and committed suicide. Böhlich's mother Edith was deported to the Theresienstadt concentration camp in 1944. Böhlich himself was ordered to do forced work in a military construction unit in 1944. In 1945, the Red Army approached and surrounded Breslau. The Nazis allowed women and children to leave the town, but all male Germans had to stay and to help defend Breslau against the Soviet army. Many of them died. But Walter Böhlich found a loophole. The Nazis had decided that he was not German, but Jewish. So he got this paper that allowed him to leave the sieged city. As a half-Jew, as he was called, it says, he is not worth fighting for Germany. That saved his life. The walls of the besieged city had a hole. Böhlich long pretended that all restrictions didn't affect him. He, like his mother and grandmother, refused to accept the definitions of the Nazis and try to make their life. Of course, he wasn't simply ignoring the facts, the persecution, 
but for himself, he simply didn't accept it. And later on, he stick to this experience. If someone wanted to define his identity, he didn't accept it. He even questioned if the concept of identity is useful at all. After giving you some information about my current research interests, let me give you now three other examples that we can discuss in class in detail. One of the most famous Jew thinkers from Germany is Moses Mendelssohn. He is one of the founding fathers of the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. The goals of the Jewish Enlightenment was the purification of Hebrew, the introduction of High German as the everyday language of the Jews, and the expansion of Jewish education to encompass more than religion. He now is something like a mythical figure, but he was born in Dessau, a rather small town some hundred kilometers south to Berlin. He was raised Jewish and later moved to Berlin. There he studied religion, philosophy and the sciences. But because there was no university at that time in Berlin, that meant he had to become a private scholar. As this he published his famous books, 7555, Philosophical Disputations in the Style of Platon, and in 1767, the Phaedon, and then 1783, his major work, Jerusalem. And he translated the Pentateuch. He is even more impressive if you think about the circumstances in which he lived. This is Berlin. It is quite small back then. You can see the wall, the zigzag around the city. That was normal for the time. One might even say a city is defined by its wall. And of course this wall has military purposes too, but more important, it allows to control what comes in and what goes out, goods and people. Access for non-citizens was limited. But there were specific rules for Jews. These restrictions are one reason why many Jews at that time settled in rural areas in Germany and not in cities. Berlin was the capital of the Prussian Kingdom. There was no ghetto in Berlin, but special rules applied to Jews. In 1650, the Edict of Admission came into law. Jews were free to settle in the Mark Brandenburg, but their number was strictly limited. The law imposed trading restrictions, and Jews had to pay a high amount of taxes annually per family. They were free to worship, but synagogues were not allowed. So when Moses Mendelssohn arrived in Berlin in 1743, all this applied to him. Jews had to use this gate the Spandauer Gate. This is the reason why most of the Jews of Berlin settled next to it. Mendelssohn was only allowed to enter because he was a student of Rabbi, Rabbi David Frenkel. 1750, a revised edict of admission was released. It restricted the number of marriages, excluded Jews from skilled labor, and it established six classes of Jews. The first class were the privileged Jews, wealthy businessmen. They and their families were allowed to settle in Berlin. They were nearly equal to the Christians. The second class were the protected Jews. Their legal status only applied to them and their first child. They could obtain the right to settle for an additional two children by paying a special tax. The members of the third class were allowed to settle in Berlin, but only them. For an additional tax they could buy this right for one of their children. Most of the Jews of this group were doctors, lawyers or artists. The fourth class were the rabbis and community workers. The fifth class were the so-called tolerated Jews. 
These were the children of the second, third or fourth class who hadn't obtained a right to settle in Berlin. They constantly had to fear to be expelled from the city. In the sixth class were the servants and cl clerks of the protected and privileged Jews. They had the permission to stay in Berlin as long as they worked for the company, and they were not allowed to marry. This sounds confusing. Well, this was obviously one of the aims of the law, to confuse. The consequences were manifold. Many Jews were forced out of Berlin, had to resettle in other places. And the legal divisions now separated the Jewish community. Everybody had to individually fight for his permit to stay in Berlin. A collective response seemed impossible. And the law changed the structure of the Jewish community too, because only rich Jews had the right to permanently settle, and so they dominated the community. And this then ignited new anti-Semitic accusations of Jews being too wealthy, etc. But this was only the consequence of the law. When this law came into force in 1750, Moses Mendelssohn was a clerk for a Jewish businessman. He belonged to the sixth class. But all his life he tried to secure first for himself and then for his family the right to stay in Berlin. So even when he was the most famous philosopher of Germany, someone who outrivaled Immanuel Kant at that time, a celebrity called Socrates of Berlin, he could never feel safe to stay where he lived. In the end of the day, that right depended on the goodwill of King Frederick II. Mendelssohn wrote many letters to him, asking for the right to permanently settle in Berlin. First, he got no answer. In 1760, a book was published containing the poems of King Frederick in Paris. Frederick II didn't initiate this publication, but nevertheless, Someone published it. The king spoke French fluently, better than German, and therefore the poems were in French too. Mendelssohn at this time worked as a literary critic. For a renowned journal he wrote a review of the poems. But how do you do this? Can you criticize the one you depend on? How do you criticize a king? Mendelssohn's approach is to lay open this difficulty. He writes, and I quote, I won't judge the poems. Them to be praised by a subject of the king isn't appropriate. Everybody could question my impartiality, and I myself question my impartiality. End of quote. After this, precautionary rhetorics, he nevertheless praises the king and the poems. He praises the purity of his heart, his humanity, the artistry of the poems. But in the end he made some critical remarks. And I quote, What a loss for our mother tongue that the king used the French language. Had he written in German, the other countries would have envied the Germans. End of quote. What a move. His argument is tricky and not unproblematic. Obviously he is not speaking from a Jewish standpoint, but as a German, saying, why is a German king using the French language? Which language then should be spoken here in Germany, here in Berlin? By this he also says, Frederick, you may have the power to restrict access to a German town, but you can't restrict my freedom to think. The king was embarrassed, and he never forgot that. In the end, Mendelssohn was too famous to deny him the right to settle in Berlin. But on Mendelssohn's application for the same rights for his wife and for his children, he wrote, in very poor German, granted for him, but not for his children. 
This is Moses Mendelssohn's reaction to walls. The city walls restricted his freedoms, but in the realm of the intellect, he defined new ones. We, Jews and non-Jews alike, are Germans. We are speaking German and speaking the truth to the king in German. Let's skip some centuries. With the unification of the German Reich in 1871, Jews got civil rights. At least this ambition of the movement for Jewish emancipation was successful for the time being. After the First World War, a young Jewish emigrant from Galicia, Masha Kaleko, moved to Berlin. She earned her living as a white-collar worker and was once employed for the employment office of the Jewish community. And in her spare time she began studying philosophy and psychology. Up from 1929 she began publishing poems in different newspapers. The topic was the ordinary lives of ordinary Berliners, oftentimes with a melancholy touch to it. These poems made her famous and well known, and in 1933 her first book, a collection of poems, was published. One of it is the following, Ashen Days. All of our ashen days pile up every quiet night, high to form a wall that towers. Stone joins stone without a hole, sadness of this empty hours looks itself within the soul. Dreams appear and melt away, ghost-like, daybreak comes at last. Always timid with delays, we reach for the brighter sky. And in shades of ashen days, we just live, cause we don't die. A wall that towers, stone joins stone, a wall leaving no escape. Berlin had no city walls anymore, but still there were walls. But what kind of walls? And our ashen days? Who is our? And what are ashen days? Why is the poem so sad? What are we to think about it? Looking at the publication date, 1933, one might think of the persecution of the Jews in the German Reich at that time. Even images of concentration camps may be evoked in the reader. I think the translator had these images in mind when he translated the poem. For the English title, Ashen Days, in German is Blasse Tage. And Blasse literally means pale. All of our ashen days, alle unsere blassen Tage, or all of our pale days. And in shades of ashen days, und im Schatten blasser Tage, and in shades of pale days. What is the difference between pale and ashen? Pale doesn't evoke images of concentration camps. It rather underlines the message of the poem to be isolated on a boring day. It is important to know that the poem was published in January 1933, so the Nazis were not in power yet. And if you look at other poems in this volume, you will find nothing that foreshadows what will come. For example, in this poem, Springtime over Berlin. Sun is stuck as if cemented, trees pretending that they sprout. Blue sky throws well ornamented just a handful clouds about. City smoke and not mace fragrance, springtime over Great Berlin. Sweet and well familiar fragrance comes at best from gasoline. Summer night park conversation, pair of lovers on the bench, but the older generation sits in garden restaurant. Mothers start to place their youngster on the sunny balcony, and two weekends after Easter, loves in season heavily. You see, 
This poem is not overtly political. Describing, as I said, ordinary Berliners' lives, it is not focusing on Jewish aspects. Rather, it contrasts Kaleko's Berlin to the image of the Roaring Twenties, you might know from movies like Berlin Babylon. So are her poems just describing the feelings of a lonely person, locked up in his or her apartment on a rainy day, longing for a brighter future, but being depressed, expressing his or her sorrows? So it isn't written from a Jewish perspective? Yes. Or it depends. Did the translator just make a mistake in writing ashes instead of pale? Even if this would be the case, it would be an insightful mistake. In 1936, a second edition was published, and now, three years into the regime of the Nazis, the poems really mean something different. At this time, all writers had to get members of the Reichskultur Chamber. Many Jews were denied entry, but not all. The main goal of the Nazis in the cultural sphere was to separate Jews from Aryans. That meant Jews were allowed to publish, but only in Jewish publishing houses. They were allowed to publish about Jewish topics, but not about German topics or German writers and philosophers like Goethe. The Nazis tried to retroactively establish the divisions they proclaimed to have existed beforehand. But despite all this, nearly 1,300 Jewish books were published in Jewish publishing houses. Of the overall 30 publishing houses, 24 were located in Berlin. There were 146 Jewish newspapers and magazines, 66 of them produced in Berlin. All of them could be openly sold at bookstalls, at least if the owner was courageous enough to sell them. Looking at this second edition, you see the name of the publishing house, Rowold Verlag, a privately owned company whose owner wasn't Jewish. With this second edition, the publisher just ignored the existing laws that ordered Jews to publish only in Jewish publishing houses. Here again, you see, just some courage was needed to find a loophole in the wall. And now, in 1936, the poem looks a bit different. Being locked up in an apartment, walls are all, all around you, certainly is something else than 1933. Now you can read it as a response to the Nazis' rise to power. And the answer of the poem, the reaction of it, is at least twofold. Existentially, it says, we ourselves locked us up. The poem, therefore, is about loneliness of the individual in a big city. And to the Nazis, it says, you are not Berliners. Kaleko always felt very attached to Berlin. This was her city, the city she longed for even after she had to emigrate first to the USA in 1938, then to Israel. Yes, the walls separate us. But we do have something in common, Jews and non-Jews alike. We are Berliners, united in sadness and in joy. The Nazis, by the way, then banned this book anyway. But their main problem wasn't that it was a book written by a Jew. They hadn't been aware of this for a long time. But how Kaleko depicted Berlin. This, how they called it, degenerate description didn't fit into their ideas of a literature that had to deal with blood and soil. Lately, very different musicians set the poem into music. You may want to listen to the songs to get a sense of how this again changes the meaning of the poem. Let's look at another Jewish woman, another poet, and her reaction in that time. This is Gertrud Kolmer, born in Berlin in 1894. She got her diploma as a language teacher in 1960. 
Later on, she worked as a kindergarten teacher. At the end of the World War I, even as a censor for the military administration, censoring letters of soldiers riding home. She published her first book in 1970, the second one in 1934, and the last one in 1938. After 1933, she became a member of the Jüdische Kulturbund, the Jewish Cultural League, an organization officially recognized by the Nazis because they wanted to concentrate all Jewish cultural activities in the Cultural League in order to better control it. This is where Gertrud Kolner felt at home. Her family owned this building in Finkenkrug next to Berlin, and it and the garden, the trees, the plants and the animals there inspired her first poems. Feeling so attached to this place, she didn't want to emigrate when it was possible. Another reason for her decision was that she felt the obligation to care for her aging father. Taking this into account, you might get a sense of what Gertrud Koma felt when her father was forced by the Nazis to sell this house. She and her family lost their home. This is a file from the Tax and Revenue Office estimating the wealth of the family in order to punish them further by imposing an additional tax to hinder them to emigrate. The family still owned real estate and had some money on the bank all in all worth around a hundred thousand marks. Nazis now wanted thirty-seven thousand marks in taxes. By reading this bureaucratic file to acquire knowledge about the process of the ever-increasing repression of Jews here in 1940. But do you get a sense of the value that this property had to their owners, to Gertrud Kolmer? In 1938 the last book of Korma was published. Here you see the dust jacket in the cover. At that time, the situation in the publishing industry had changed a lot. It was far more restricted. And it got worse. After the night of broken glasses on the 9th of November 1938, the Nazis banned nearly all cultural activities of Jews. But here, you can see, in 1938, there is still a Jewish publishing house. It is that of Erwin Löwe, Jüdische Buchverlag. Kolmer's book wasn't widely recognized, except in the Jewish community. The Jüdische Kulturbund, the Jewish Cultural League, organized readings of her poems. Some reviews in Jewish magazines praised the book. One of the poems is called The Jewish Monk. It starts I am a stranger. Since no one dares approach me, I would be girded with towers that wear their steep and stone-gray caps aloft in clouds. The brazen key you will not find that locks the musty stair. It spirals skyward as a serpent lifts its scaly head into the light. Here the walls and the tower are giving protection. They provide security, as something that blocks off the hostility of the outside world, to guard oneself with towers. But the interesting thing is how the poem continues. It's quite a long poem, so I have to summarize it. The female first-person narrator starts an expedition into this imaginary tower. And there she discovers her ancient land. She finds the Ur of the Chaldeans, the idol Dagon, Hebrews' tents, and the Horn of Jericho. She finds self-confidence in wearing novel robes she found in the tower, and she finds, quote, shelter for her soul, end of quote. Inspired by the biblical Deborah, she discovers the beauty of the Jewish tradition and finds back to her roots. This is Gertrud Kolmer's answer. A tower can protect you. It provides a safe space. And here you can find back to your Jewishness. But again, this is only one way to interpret the poem. Because the end of it goes like this. Enormous 
crumbling columns of wind, as green as nephrite, red as coral, blow across the towers. God lets them fall in ruin, and yet they stand for ages more. So an ambivalence remains. How protective then now the walls of the tower? Why is God destroying them? Is there still hope hidden somewhere in the ruins? The poem gives no answer. In the same year the poem was published, Gertrude Kolmer and her father were forced to sell their house in Finkenkrug and had to move into this building in Berlin, Speirerstraße 10, a Judenhaus. Stones and walls again, certainly not protective ones this time, and not empty at all, but overcrowded. Up from July 1941, Gertrude Kolmer was forced to do slave labor in an arms factory. In September 1942, her father was deported to the concentration camp Theresienstadt, where he died in 1943. On the 2nd of March, Gertrud Kolmer was deported to Auschwitz and murdered. Kolmer again and again used the image of the tower, walls around space, like here in her poem Tower, the last stanza reads. Perhaps my soul forgot me in my dream, and sank, wings spread towards morning, where the tower stood to meet its wandering flight, and roved through hot, enchanted, lifeless rooms, in search of ancestors, and touched the hovering strings that still resound. The soul, separated from the body of the narrator, is still in search of ancestors. The strings are still resounding. I spoke about four different reactions to walls and towers, to divisions and repression. Walter Böhlich tried to ignore them by sheer luck finding a loophole. Moses Mendelssohn spoke as a German and a Jew. Masha Kaleko spoke as a Berliner and a Jew. Gertrud Kolmer as a Jewish woman and a Jewish poet. Mendelssohn is redefining the walls. Kaleko bemoans the walls found alone in an often overwhelming and anonymous city. And Koma longs to be protected by the walls of her religion. Four different ways to react to walls and towers, to restrictions and repression, each one valuable and maybe helpful even today? That's worth discussing, maybe in Berlin. See you. We hope you've enjoyed this week's lecture. You can find the dates and descriptions for all sessions in our digital lecture series, as well as information about our instructors and their courses on our website. Also, connect with us on social media and attend one of our informational webinars. Thank you very much for watching and we hope to see you again soon, online or on site here in Berlin.